All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for um, the PBS Presents the Cyber Threats and Payroll Transactions webinar. My name is Ashley Culliver, and I am the Director of Business Development with PBS. Um, just a little bit about us. PBS was established over 18 years ago. We have grown to be one of Alabama's largest locally owned payroll and PEO outsourcing form, um, firms. We have a direct um, and very innovative service-oriented mindset. Our ultimate mission is to provide peace of mind to our clients and be there through all of their payroll and benefit needs. So today we would like to thank you for taking the time to join us on this morning webinar. This morning's webinar. Um, again, this is PBS presents Cyber Threats in Payroll Transactions. Um, before we get started, there are just a couple of housekeeping items to mention. If you have any questions, you can use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. There will also be polling questions. So if you would like to receive CPE credit, please answer those as they pop up. Today, we are very fortunate to have Jonathan Perez with us this morning. And a little bit of background about Jonathan. He is the Senior Security Analyst for Abacus Technologies. In his role, he oversees the security team, engineers security solutions for clients, analyzes and remediates security threats and also spearheads security product development and implementation. Jonathan holds a master's degree in cybersecurity from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And as a successful small business owner, he now uses those skills and experience to help develop and enhance Abacus Technologies' rapidly growing security practice. It is now my pleasure to turn the webinar over to you, Jonathan. And um, if you guys have any questions along the way, please put them in the chat, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Hey, Ashley, thanks for that uh, introduction. And uh, again, thank you for everybody coming out this morning. I want to echo Ashley on that. Uh, I know everybody's busy, but uh, uh, taking the opportunity to come out and hear a little bit about cybersecurity is uh, is always a good thing. Uh, it might It's one of those topics that doesn't get talked about enough and needs more uh, uh, opportunities to talk about it. So I'm thankful for uh, PBS giving me this opportunity to do a little cyber evangelism was what I've come to call it. And just talking about cybersecurity in general and how cybersecurity is so critical in the current culture and environment, uh, cybersecurity is so critical to your business operations. So we want to spend a little time talking about that, particularly in the realm of payroll. And we'll get into that in just a second. As Ashley has said, my name's Jonathan Purs. I'm Senior Security Analyst for Abacus Technologies. Of course, uh, we are uh, PBS's sister company, and we handle cybersecurity as well as the IT for PBS. And so, uh, um, of course, uh, anything we talk about, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, is going to, uh, we'll say some things, I think, that'll challenge you and cause you to think about cybersecurity and maybe even scare you a little bit, to be honest. I know even as I read stories of about things that are happening right now online, and for example, the MGM Grand, they managed to hack the MGM Grand just this week, and they still can't operate their door locks or their hotel rooms as a result of that ransomware. And so there are just bad things happening every day in the cybersecurity realm, and it's a scary environment out there. But that's what I get to do every day is, is work to uh, put things in place to prevent bad things like that from happening. So it brings the first question, and it, it seems like a give me question, but we don't want to take it for granted. What is cybersecurity? Now, let me sub it up this way. Cybersecurity is risk reduction. We're talking about risk here. We're talking about mitigating risk. I like to use a baseball analogy uh, to describe this for a second. And in baseball, obviously, you'll see some guys, particularly really short guys, get down real low. They might not have a real good batting average. And so they'll get down real low. And what they're doing is decreasing the strike zone. They're making that area in which the pitcher, in order for the pitcher to throw a strike, really small. And so as much as possible anyway, they can't reduce it completely. But the, the smaller they make it, the harder it is to throw a strike against that batter. And so every effort we make in cybersecurity that reduces the possible ways that you can be attacked is what cybersecurity is. We're trying to reduce that risk as well as create an environment where resiliency exists. So it's not a question of if you're going to get attacked, but when. 
And then what happens if that attack is successful? What things do we have in place to mitigate that as well as recover from a successful attack? There's no 100% in the cybersecurity world, but what if I told you by doing some basic things, we can reduce your strike zone by 85%? Statistically, that's been demonstrated, just and we call that basic hygiene. And a lot of companies don't even realize or ask themselves, well, what kind of basic hygiene do we have in place? We'll talk more about that as we go on. But the next question I want to answer about cybersecurity just generally is, what is the return of investment on cybersecurity? And this is a question that I get asked a lot because, look, when we look at the bottom line, cybersecurity always looks like a negative. And so the question I'm asking here is, uh, the point I want to make is that cybersecurity, at the end of the day, protects profits. You see, cybersecurity, when done correctly, lives in the world of it did not happen. In other words, we're preventing bad things from happening to your company. And how do you quantify it did not happen in terms of dollars and cents on the bottom of the line? You can't. It didn't happen. And so cybersecurity, what it does is it keeps criminals from hurting your bottom line and taking your profits. That's our objective. That's our goal in the business world. And that's an important goal. I think everybody would agree. And so who is responsible for cybersecurity? And this might seem like another give me question, but it's not. You see, cybersecurity is a business decision. It's not an IT function. Now, and that's contrary to popular belief or practice. A lot of companies simply depend upon their IT to handle cybersecurity, or they assume that their IT department is handling cybersecurity. A lot of smaller businesses have an IT person, one person. And that person is doing all they can to keep the, the computers running, the network running, keep everything to the best of their ability functional functioning and they do a fantastic job at that it's not to say the it guy or gal knows nothing about cybersecurity. they do but cybersecurity, more than anything else belongs in the c-suite it belongs in the management realm it's a business decision it's a series of business decisions really it's risk mitigation and so while IT can implement your cybersecurity initiatives, the key stakeholders are at the highest levels of the business. Mind you, as we said, IT is doing everything they can to keep the eyes on their eyes on things, but cybersecurity in the current threat environment really requires special attention. It requires individual attention. Having an individual person or a team keeping an eye on your cybersecurity is almost essential today. And so can't emphasize that enough. But the next, and really getting into the meat of our topic now that we understand cybersecurity a little bit and some basics about cybersecurity, and maybe have cleared up some misconceptions about cybersecurity, is if we're looking at payroll, if we're looking at HR, if we're looking at customer management and various things associated with this, how does cybersecurity play a role in this? Now, I want to do a little interactive exercise here. If you could find your chat window, it's going to be right next to the Q&A button on your webinar window there, probably down on the bottom. And uh, if you open that up for a second, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to put an input in there just to get a sense of what we're looking at on a scale of one to five, one being really concerned. And you can do two, three, or four, or five. Five being you feel real good about it. I want you to type the number right now that represents how you feel right now about your current company's current cybersecurity posture. I'm seeing some threes and fours. There are some ones and twos in there. Some people are really concerned about it. A lot right in the middle, which means you're not sure is what I'm getting here. And so that's that's important. That's important. There's a lot of fours in theirs as well, and that's good. And for those fives feeling really confident about it, I think I might say some things today that might cause you to question that a little bit, maybe. But we're going to talk about that. I appreciate that. Thanks for uh, putting all those responses in there. Now, in light of that, uh, let me ask you another question. Using that same scale, type the number that represents how you feel about your the security of your data right now, not cybersecurity in general, but of your data right now, particularly your payroll and HR data. This is another important question. And you have to think about data separately. 
data is a big ugly in a lot of companies. We've got a lot of data. We're generating new data every day, but not everybody knows what where their data is and what's in their data. And so this is important to question, uh, an important question to think about. Where is my data? What's in it? And if we were ransomed right now, what would they get? What would be accessible to them? All right, and one more question on this front. And thank you, everybody, for participation. There's a lot of threes and fours, and there's still some twos and ones, though. And so uh, those are some things we want to look at. Type the number, same scale, type the number that expresses how you feel about your ability to recover from a cybersecurity attack when it happens. In other words, you have things like a disaster response plan in place. Have you thought about that in advance? Does everybody on your team know their jobs? If the worst case scenario happens, or would you be scattering and trying to grab information from this corner and that corner in order to piece together everything you got? And here's one that ties into this question. Might want to make you change your answer. Have you tested your backups? You might have backups, but you have them. Have you seen them actually function? Have you brought them up to see if they will reboot your computers and your servers? And you see, these are important questions. This is cybersecurity, and it impacts all things. Now, if your employees stopped getting paid because you were attacked and you couldn't bring your computer systems online that handled the payroll or handled functions like that, you could see how bad this would get real quick. And so I want you to think about payroll now as we go on. Thanks for your participation on that. That was great. And so let's look at this for a second here as we get into this. Uh, I went and did a quick search on the internet just for some recent articles and headlines uh, regarding cybersecurity in particular as it relates to payroll and human resources. Uh, here was one, uh, uh, one headline, hackers across several states, I believe this was in Virginia, employees uh, uh, access employees' payroll data. And so they just got social security numbers. They got how much they were being paid. They got all kinds of juicy information that they can use in other attacks. Uh, but also, uh, it's a lot of personal information in payroll data that's available. Here's another one. Minneapolis Public Schools confirms hackers released personal data. Now, even in regards to that, the first thing you think about is the students. And that's a terrible thing. But there was payroll data involved in what was released. On the dark web, dark web is a big, scary term for a portion of the Internet that hackers like to use. And there's some techniques to get into the dark web, if you would, but not a place to go and play. You're likely to come out of there with some bad stuff on your computer. Here's another article, the BA, BBC and Boots. These are all British companies who were hit by a cybersecurity breach with contact and bank details exposed. Now, this was an interesting one because this was a... This this involved a piece of software that had some vulnerabilities in it that they were it wasn't even so much them that were using it, but a company, one of their vendors was using it and it caused payroll data to be exposed. Here's another one. Almost five hundred thousand dollars were swiped in the city of Tallahassee. It's Tallahassee, Florida, in a payroll hack. How would you feel if five hundred thousand dollars walked out the door right now in your company would that be a game ending situation or would that seriously devastate i don't think anybody in their right mind would be pleased about that and we've heard of far worse now this is just a small sampling this was five minutes of looking okay but in these what you've got is this hack was stolen credentials this hack was malware this hack was vulnerable software and this hack was a phishing email one person, one choice, one click, and voila, $500,000 walked out the door. That's how quickly it happens and how bad it can be. And so I, I say this to wake us up a little bit, not so much to scare us, but to wake us up and to make us realize the current threat environment over the past five to 10 years has changed. Uh, cybersecurity and particularly the opposite side of that, what these hackers are doing is big business. They actually run businesses, have business models. They train their employees just like we do, except they're doing the, the one difference between us and them is they don't care about the law. 
and they're doing criminal things. And so it's important for us to recognize that these things are going on and they do impact payroll and payroll impacts all of us at the end of the day. And so I just want to bring that up to wake us up a little bit about this. Now, how will criminals attack payroll transactions? The number one way uh, by a large margin is email. Email is the one thing that connects us all. Every company that uses email, and everybody you communicate, you are connected through email, whether you realize it or not. If you've ever had an account compromised, an email account compromised of one of your employees, and they started, the hacker started to use that email account to send out bad email, you'll realize in about five minutes after you start getting phone calls, hey, I got this email from you, and it had some bad links in it. Well, and and is it real? Is it supposed to be, you know, and and you'll get about 100 of those, 500 of those, however many contacts are in that person's contact list. And then you'll realize just how connected and exponential email is in terms of an attack. And so emails are the biggest way in which folks are being attacked. Phishing attacks. Phishing is, you know, is cybersecurity lingo. If you're not familiar with it, then we need to we need to think about security awareness training, but phishing attacks. And if you're not practicing, seeing a lot of reps on phishing, you want to uh, you want to start to do that. But phishing attacks are the most common attack vector. What they'll do is they're going to send out a phishing email, and the whole goal of this is to gather information. It's a fraudulent email intended to gather information. Hopefully, passwords is what they want. They want usernames and passwords more than anything else, but they'll go slow. They'll go all different kinds of ways to get this information that they want. They'll tie some social engineering in with this, but at the end of the day, they're looking for information that they can use to attack you. And it might not be obvious information, but being able to identify phishing emails is huge. Now, when we talk about payroll, payroll notifications and uh, bogus payroll notifications and and, uh, fish and phishing emails are probably the biggest things. Fake HR messages, tax scams, direct deposit changes. Well, you know, somebody might break into an account and we see this quite often. The very first thing they can do, they realize this guy, this person's got no real data that I can compromise here. But what I can do is I can... I can put some parameter rules in place so they can't see what I'm doing in their email box. And I'm going to use their email box to send a request to have their payroll forwarded to my account as a hacker. And so they're going to send out a new routing number and say, could you change my routing number? And unless there's some really good controls in place in the company, internal controls, we've seen it where that's been approved. I've seen it go so far, interestingly enough, that the internal controls were being exercised. Well, please send us a a, a cancel a copy of a canceled voided check so that we can do that. And they actually, the hackers actually sent a copy of a voided check. What was interesting about this particular one that I'm thinking of was that the check was actually from a bank that the person who was compromised, their account was compromised, used to bank at. They no longer bank there, but they used to bank there. And not only that, it actually had the address that she grew up in, in the house that she grew up in. And so they will go to great lengths to actually perpetrate this fraud. And so, again, these these people are really good at what they do. And unless we on the other side of this are really good at what we do, and that includes you. Don't think cybersecurity is just the cybersecurity guy's job. It's your job, too, unless you're really good at what you do. You're not going to identify these things, and you might actually send some money somewhere else that doesn't, you know, and again, hitting that bottom line, hitting profits. And so, and a lot of these things don't make headline news. A little trickle here, a little trickle there. And we brush it off as a lesson learned, but it costs money at the end of the day. And you see enough of these, it costs a lot of money. CEO and CFO fraud. I want you to notice the two things that you see here. CEO, that's the decision maker. CFO, that's the wallet. Decision maker and a wallet are the two biggest targets for email scams in a company, whether it's pretending to be the CEO or CFO or directly attacking the CEO or CFO. W-2 scams are another thing that you're going to see. Um, improper transfer of information, folks transferring 
data that has that, that or information such as personal ident personal identifiable information sending that type of information over regular email that's just not good we don't need to be doing that we need to have good tools in place to send that type of information because it's sensitive information and then emergency scenarios it's always about an emergency scenario the whole idea of a phishing attack is to create a sense of urgency if i can create a sense of urgency they're going to act first think second and so that's what they want them to do whereas whenever we're looking at email we have to be vigilant we have to be thinking first acting second don't just click on a link because it's in an email and it looks like it's coming from the person it should be let me tell you something uh, about another type of attack you often see associated with phishing attacks and that's called typo squatting strange word i know but here's what they do let's say you got a company called i don't know hooper electronics what they'll do is they will actually a hacker will buy the domain name hooper electronics but they'll put an extra o in there so instead of two O's, you've got three O's. That's called typo squatting. So they're going to sit on that domain name, and now they're going to use that domain name to send emails from that look like they're coming from the person, unless you're paying real close attention and actually checking the email address next to the name that's listed there. You're not going to recognize that real quick. That's hard to see. And so then they're going to slip in an invoice or a direct deposit change or something else. And it looks like it's coming from this person. So at quick glance, you might think, okay, I'm going to go do this. It's coming from this person. Okay. And then you do it. And then oh, voila, bad guy gets his money and, and you've got, and you've got to explain to the boss why that happened. That's what we want to avoid. We want, and knowledge is power. Knowing about these things and how they use these things is important. Let me tell you about this real quick. Um, we've got a webinar coming up in a little while, uh, 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 not too far from now, about AI. Well, AI is major headline news. It's all over the place. It seems to have just taken the world by storm. Well, if we're using it, guess what? The bad guys are using it too. You've heard of chat GPT, I'm sure. Well, there's a thing called worm GPT where they took... A, a language model and actually deconstructed it and and filled it up with information so that it can be used by hackers to create really effective uh, uh, phishing emails as well as write code that can be used for uh, bad scripts and various other things. And so now they're using AI to write their scripts. And so you can't count on bad grammar, spelling mistakes, and various other things to make emails easily identifiable. They're getting harder and harder to identify. Hence, more reps are needed to be able to identify these things, which where security awareness training comes in. We'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. But payroll automatically creates a sense of urgency all by itself. You threaten somebody's paycheck. You say there needs to be a, a change to your payroll or there was some information change and you put that in an email and you send it to somebody. Their initial response is going to be to click on it. You mean I might not get paid Friday? I'm going to click on this and check what's going on. And then they enter their login information, uh, their username and their password, thinking they're going to their online portal for their payroll, when in fact it was a fake website because it was the link was pointed them to a website that looks like their online portal, but isn't. Again, hackers now just got username and password. They're immediately, they're sitting and monitoring this. They're going to take that information. They're going to go log into the real portal and they're going to steal things. And that's how the game is played. It's, it's, it's a very rapid pace. These things are happening. Uh, this just, I, you show me an inbox and I'll show you a phishing email. Uh, that's the way it is. You are, and phishing emails are different from spam. Let me say this. Spam is harmless. It's a nuisance, but it's harmless. There's nothing malicious about spam. It's just, it's annoying. Phishing emails are not harmless. They are malicious. They are dangerous. They they can cost money. They can cause all kinds of damage. Somebody can take a starting with a simple phishing email and turn it into a ransomware attack that impacts the entire company and shuts it down for two weeks. If your company shut down for two weeks, what would that do to your business? What if it shut down for months because you didn't have good backups? It's an automatic game changer. How important is, is email? How important is having our employees take email seriously? Incredibly important.
can't emphasize this enough. And so, especially when it comes to payroll. Now let's talk about data for a second. We brought up data a few minutes ago, but how is your HR and payroll data stored and handled? Now, obviously, a company like PBS, we handle that. They store their data in a secure fashion. We make sure of it. If they don't, I, I go and talk and we have conversations, but we're paying attention to that. Now, if you talk about, but what if they sent you some data that you needed and what are you doing with that data once they've sent it to you? Are you storing it in a safe manner? Are you handling that data properly? What's in it? What's uh, And what's important? See, payroll and personal identifiable information that are incredibly valuable to criminals. This is probably one of the highest sought after data pools on the dark web because this, this data contains everything they need to get to money, which is 95% of the time their goal. They're just trying to make money. And so it's important to understand and have policies in place that are enforced in regards to and controls in place, internal controls are in place that are enforced about how we handle and store data with PI. You know, I'll give you a horror story. Uh, company right now that 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 we they had to involve legal because one account was compromised, an HR person's account was compromised, and this HR person was not properly handling the payroll data and HR data, and so as a result. This person was saving data on their desktop, on their computer, payroll data and HR data and 401k data and various other documents that had sensitive data in it. And because that system was compromised, it, they have to assume that everything on that system was compromised, meaning anybody who had any information in there uh, because this comp company requires has their their laws that require them to report might have to report and very well will have to report those things and provide uh, debt counseling and identity theft covering and and and, and uh, credit reporting uh, services to all the people that were involved with that. And it all started with a compromised account, but because data wasn't handled properly, it became significantly worse. Now, you're going to have a compromised account from time to time because of a poor password or something. But if there's no data on the machine for them to get to and they don't have any admin privileges, it's a loss for the, the best they can do is try and send a phony email, which will probably get identified real quick and handled. But you see how bad this gets really fast. So proper training about handling data storage is important having data classification systems is huge that is the 800 pound gorilla sitting in everybody's conference room right now nobody knows what to do with it we're creating new data every day it's getting older and older how many companies here and no show of hands or anything but just think about this how many of you have data sitting on your machines that's older than seven years old that's older than 10 years old why if it's sitting there, it's available for hackers to take. Why not put that in cold storage somewhere? Why not secure that? One of the reasons is because we don't know how old our data is, and that's an important thing. And so, and not only that, just improperly transmitting or sharing this data via email is risky. And so there's a lot of ways, and this, this can include tax forms, pay stubs for 1K data, payroll reports, benefits data. Those bonuses are juicy targets for uh, hackers. Even job applications have some sensitive data on it. We need to scrub our job applications that we're storing and make sure there's no sensitive data there. It just opens you and exposes you to risk. That's needless. And so again, data is an important way they'll attack payroll transactions. Let's talk about another thing for a second. That's software vulnerabilities. This is another huge area. How secure is your payroll software? your human resource management software, your payroll software. This is important to ask yourself, you know, and a lot of companies don't think about this, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, security. Well, they figure, well, the company's got to know what they're doing. Well, have you asked the right questions? Have you challenged your software company uh, to see if they've got security in place on their stuff? You talk about the dangers of an ex what they call an ESS, an employee self-serve service portal. That's something that's sitting out there in the internet right now exposed to the World Wide Web. 
hackers love those things. They love to target those things because a lot of times there's exploits that can be uh, used to gain access. And we're talking about all kinds of things. Now, this is going to get a little technical for a second in some of this jargon, but authentication vulnerabilities, what we're really talking about, weak passwords. You know, if somebody has got a password, let's say you have a password, use the same password for everything, your Netflix account, as well as your, that's your password to access the ESS, the employee self-service portal. Well, if they can compromise Netflix and get that password, which Netflix has been compromised before, and a lot of passwords from Netflix are sitting out in the dark web right now, they they might have the same path. If you use the same password to get into your, your payroll portal or your HR portal, well, there you have it. They've got it already. The question is just them putting one and one together, and it's just a matter of time. Brute force attack. So that means they're going to keep guessing at passwords until they finally get in. Sometimes it's credential leaks. They log in, they get a bunch of passwords off one person's computer, and then they use those passwords to access other people's computers. And so you can have authorization issues. In other words, who has access to what? And who has what privileges? It's not uncommon for me to do a security assessment and realize that everybody, all 20 people on the management team have global access rights to the network. That's not necessary. Matter of fact, that's a major risk. You don't want that. Not only that, if you've got data pools that have private information in it, you want to make sure those are isolated and limited. Only You want to have the concept of least privilege in place. Only those who need access should have access. Data encryption weakness, no encryption on sensitive data. That's another bad thing. Uh, we can talk about injection vulnerabilities. This is where whenever you fill out a form on the web, sometimes people, uh, hackers will put code into that form entry to see if it breaks the form and exposes a vulnerability there. And so there has to be validation on every form field. And a lot of companies don't think about that. Software development companies don't think about that. Injection vulnerabilities. Uh, we talked about that software and patching management. This is probably the biggest area. When was the last time your payroll software, if you're using that, or when was the last time all your software, any of your software really was patched and updated? End of life software. A lot of companies are using unsupported software. It hit end of life. It's no longer being receiving security updates. That's dangerous. And it doesn't have to be your payroll software. It doesn't have to be. It could be your Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that you're keeping all your passwords in. Microsoft just every second Tuesday of the month releases a bunch of patches. They just released a bunch yesterday, uh, two days ago, actually, that um, and some very high level critical patches. That software has got to be patched continuously because they're constantly finding new ways to exploit it and new mistakes in the code. Uh, Third-party dependencies, file sharing is a big one. Right now, there's a file program called Move It, which is used to transfer files. Interestingly enough, supposedly securely transfer files. Well, there's a, a vulnerability in that software that is being exploited in the wild like mad and causing a lot of issues. In, in cybersecurity. And so these are the type of things that you want to be thinking about. How, how, how current is your software? You want people looking at this. Another, the last and probably most important thing, because I think everything's going to boil down to this, is untrained employees. I know when you talk about uh, security awareness training, you often see a, a lot of folks glaze over the eyes. That's the thing we do once a year, right? I don't even remember what, what was in there last time, but that's that thing we do that we have to do. It's a compliance issue. Can't have cybersecurity insurance unless we do that. Well, we got to stop thinking about security awareness training as a compliance component. We need to start thinking about it as an investment in your team, You know, especially folks who handle secure data like your HR team or the person who communicates with your payroll company. You know, you might work with PBS for your payroll, but who's the liaison in your company who communicates with them? And how do they, how much training do they have in cybersecurity? That's important. They need to be generally aware. They need to have some basic knowledge of cybersecurity and the risks involved in, in looking for phishing emails and how to handle data 
They need to, that's an investment that will pay off in spades. Again, it's not going to show up as a positive on the bottom line. It's going to be a negative. It's going to cost you money and time for that employee, but it's money well spent because you're either going to spend the money and invest in your team, or you're going to pay the hackers. And we'll emphasize that again later on, but we've got to break out of the compliance mindset. If we're going to start overcoming some of these obstacles, it's the biggest risk area that you have. And likely unrealized uh, risk areas. As a matter of fact, your people can be your first and best defense, or they can be your biggest and great, uh, your greatest weakness when it comes to cybersecurity. You know that check forge that I told you about earlier, where the hacker sent that bad check. Well, if somebody didn't have the wherewithal to to know, I probably should confirm this with the employee and they stuck to their compliance. Uh, they stuck to their internal controls and did what was necessary next. If they didn't take the next step and confirm that information and just stopped there and went ahead and sent the paycheck, money would have walked out the door. Using MFA, multi-factor authentication, you know, the six-digit codes you got to enter all the time, real tedious, kind of like unlocking the door in your house when you got two bags of groceries in your hand. It's kind of tedious, but you lock the door because you don't want criminals getting in. Well, that's that MFA code. It's a simple thing, but it actually prevents bad guys from getting in. Having your people trained on this stuff is just so critical. And we talk about this. Phishing and social engineering attacks, weak passwords, how to tell a weak password from a good password, why we don't use pass the same password for everything or variations on the same password for everything by just adding a number at the end. You know, don't use your pet's names because they could just go to your social media account, find out what your pet's name was, and they've got a pretty good chance of getting your pet. Uh, and I imagine some people just lowered their heads a little bit. I can't see you right now, but usually when I do this in person and I make that point, some people kind of shrink down their seat a little bit, realizing, yes, my password is Buffy1234 because that's their kitty's name. All right. So failure to recognize suspicious activity, ignorant of or not following policy or worse yet, having policy that's not enforced. Important, critical, misconfiguration of software. You might have great software, but it's only as good as it's configured. It's not uncommon for us to look at a firewall and see that that firewall has been completely misconfigured and is actually not stopping anything from happening. Misuse of privileges. Sometimes the problem is internal. You have an employee doing bad things and you're not aware of it because you have nothing, no visibility on it. And so that's important. As a matter of fact, Mercer's 2020 Global Talent Trend Study made this observation. Over two-thirds, 62% of executives believe the greatest threat to their organization's cybersecurity is workers' inability to follow data security standards, not hackers or vendors. So that's how we feel about it. So what we've got to do is we've got to put some training in place and some enforcement in place. So this type of stuff doesn't happen. All right, let's kind of wrap this up a little bit with some things we can do to protect your company. First thing I want to say is be proactive about cybersecurity. Don't wait till you get attacked. Since I started working in this job, what I've come up, I've come up with this little saying, we'll instill cybersecurity one breach at a time. Or my other saying is never let a good breach go to waste. That's unfortunate that we got to feel that way. Be proactive about cybersecurity. Get ahead of the game. Put some measures in place now. Reduce that risk. Decrease that strike zone. If you're not sure how to do it, find a trusted and knowledgeable cybersecurity advisor. I'd be glad to help. Have a security assessment completed. When was the last time you've had that done? Look at that. Have it done. That cybersecurity assessment is going to give you a roadmap to becoming more secure. That's the goal of a risk assessment. Have that done. Look at what you've got in place so at least you know where the chinks in your armor are. And then you can put some defenses in place. Establish strong and enforced internal controls for all payroll and HR processes. Even if another company is handling your payroll like PBS, have controls in place so that when they communicate with you, that data is stored in a secure place. When they communicate with you, you're confirming and checking to make sure 
that we we really live in a zero trust culture when it comes to cybersecurity. And you're going to hear that phrase, zero trust, come up more and more. It's becoming more important. Here's some other things you can do on this regard. Differentiate responsibilities. Don't put all the responsibility for payroll in one person's hand. Don't give them the keys to the kingdom. Spread that out a little bit. So if you are compromised, if one of those account passwords or accounts is compromised, if they don't get everything, audit your logs. I can't emphasize this boring work, but spend some time. Check up on what's happening. Make sure those logs are being audited. Sometimes a quick look can reveal something that otherwise might not be revealed. And by all means, use secure communications. Don't use email to transfer private information, personal information, PII information. Use thoroughly vetted payroll and HR software or use a payroll provider who has invested in cybersecurity. Like I said, we handle PBS as cybersecurity. They have invested in cybersecurity and we monitor that for them. And so it's important. Make sure that that's what you're using. And likewise, invest in a well-developed cybersecurity awareness training program for your people. It's money incredibly well spent. As a matter of fact, this last chart I'm going to show you is, is put together by No Before, the company that we use for security awareness training. And what they say here, and this is an interesting statistic, during the initial test, one in three of your people are going to click on a phishing, e -link, a phishing link. We usually do a blind simulation right off the bat just to see what would happen. We do it in mass and we do it with a really hard email. And this statistic holds true time and time again. So that's 33% of your people clicked on a phishing link. That means that many opportunities for a bad guy to get in. After 90 days of training, that number's cut in half. Just 90 days of training. Not one-time training, but recurring training on a monthly basis, which is what we recommend right now. Train your people, keep cybersecurity in front of them on a monthly basis. So minimum, it doesn't have to be a long time. It'll be five to 10 minute training, but keep it in front of them. You want them thinking about it year round, not just at the beginning of the year and not in a state of mind that says, I have to do this in order to get through, you know, this, 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 the, I hate this stuff. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be much better than that. And then after one year of training, that number is reduced to 5%. That's a huge risk reduction. OK, but at the end of the day, here's what I would say. Which is the better investment? Spend your money to train your team or spend your money recovering from preventable attacks? I think we all know the answer to that question. And so it boils down to this. And this is something Brian Jackson likes to say, our COO. Put cybersecurity on the agenda before it becomes the agenda. A hack, a, a cyber attack can can not only hack, but just hijack your entire agenda. It can become everything. All your plans have to get laid aside. All the positive things you're doing, the money lost might hinder growth opportunities that you had in front of you. Put cybersecurity on the agenda before it becomes the agenda. And so with that said, I want to open it up to any questions and answers, and then we'll turn things back over to Ashley. There's a question and answer box there. You can throw your questions up there. And um, and I'd be glad to answer them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be content related to this, but anything cybersecurity related. And so I'm watching here. I'm not seeing any questions. Hey, Jonathan, I did have one question sent to me yes. outside. Um, I know that we're recording this um, webinar as well, but can we submit your slides along with the recording? Yes, I'll make sure you have our slides and, and we can absolutely do that. Perfect, awesome. And I know that there's some pop-up questions along the way as far as like the poll question, so make sure that you're doing that. Um, we have another question in the webinar chat. Um, do you have a vendor that you guys recommend for training? I know that you mentioned no before, but anything else that we could do we really I, I i i be honest i've looked at a bunch of them and we love no before they're at the top of their game um it, the training the quantity quality of the training material is interesting they have a series called the inside man it's like a netflix binge worthy series and that's probably the most common question i get when is the next season of no, uh, the inside man coming out folks love this stuff but it actually trains a lesson 
or it, it it gives a lesson in cybersecurity with each five to seven minute episode. And it's it's really good and it kind of sticks. We do it as optional training, and then we have more targeted training on passwords and stuff. But all of their training is very realistic. It's current. Um, it was developed uh, um, uh, well, uh, by some of the world's greatest ethical hackers. And so it's good stuff. No before is, is just fantastic. And when done properly, when executed the way they designed it, and we actually offer this as a service as an advocate, not really a shameless plug, but it is. And if you want us to do that, we can implement that for you. But that's something we can help you with. Reach out to me. You've got my information on a slide and we can talk more about that. But no before is by far uh, the best one. And it is, yes, exactly as you put it there. It's uh, K-N-O- W B E four, the number four. And so that's what you want to look for. And then um, um, there was another question. Do you have a vendor uh, for security assessment? We, again, uh, I'll say this, that most cybersecurity companies, most security companies will do security assessments for you. There are some who specialize in it. At Abacus, we do security assessments, risk assessments. We do Microsoft 365 assessments. We do data risk assessments. We go to top to the bottom. We can tailor an assessment and target specific areas if you want to look at that, or we can do a general assessment, a first-time assessment. We use standard controls, and the key is you want to make sure that they're using NIST or CIS controls or something along those lines as their background for these type of things. You know, a lot of these automated, inexpensive assessments aren't going to get you the information you need. You need somebody to come in, run some scans. You need somebody to take a look at what's actually on your network and how things are secured. And so not all assessments are created equal. Another question here is what software do you recommend for password storage and management? That's a really good question. Password, password management software is, is important. There's a couple of tools. There's a bunch of tools out there that are really good. We're constantly assessing them. Some of our guys like to use Keeper. Uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other names that popped off the top of my head, and it's going to take me a second to remember. I really like Keeper for a lot of different reasons for a company. And and when you get a keeper license, you also get a home password manager, a personal password manager to go with that. You want to keep those passwords separate, your personal from your business passwords. But that's really LastPass was another good one. Um, they were hacked recently. But let me tell you something about that. That hack was a little sidebar issue that happened. They made a lot of news. But what really happened there, uh, but LastPass is going to come out of that stronger than ever. They're going to be as solid as can be on that front. But there are a bunch. RoboForm is another password manager we use around here. And so that's a good one, too. And so there's a lot of different options. Depends what you're looking for. But do your research. Ask some really good questions. If you'd like to talk more about that, we can. But yes, password manager is critical. Why? Because you can up the ante on the, the difficulty of your passwords. It makes it easier to manage a bunch of different passwords. Funny story about passwords is I remember when I didn't have to have a password. Nobody had passwords except spies. Now we've all got hundreds of passwords and you need something to manage those. So any other questions? We did have yeah. another one come in. Um, how often should you have a cyber assessment done? You know, Here's the thing. A good assessment is going to last a while because it's going to give you a roadmap to build security. But then as you implement new measures, as things in your company change, as you change people, as you as processes change, you should reassess those processes. And then there's also the other reality that over time, you know, the threat environment changes. And so you need to reassess against the new threat environments. And so there are a lot of factors that weigh into it. It's not a simple do one every year. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have an assessment done every year. Some people have to have, some companies have to have an assessment done every year for compliance issues. As a matter of fact, anybody doing business with the government is going to have to have assessments done based upon a new standard, CMMC standard, that is going to become law before long here. And so there's just some realities in the cyber world. And you're going to see a lot more third-party risk questionnaires and things that are going to require assessments. So that's a really important uh, thing. Do you have thoughts and recommendations on shared passwords within a company? You know, it depends what you mean by shared passwords. 
if you mean everybody using the same account, that's not a good security practice. Bad security practice. Everybody needs to have their own login and their own password for auditing purposes. Shared passwords become a breeding ground for all kinds of problems. And so um, uh, uh, standards, re framework, recommendations, policies should always include individual passwords that are managed by individuals. For example, let's say one person on a team and they all share the same password for a login. One person on that team leaves and somebody forgets to change the password because that one person left. Now, that password just walked out the door with that person. And if that person left for bad reasons, now you've got a disgruntled employee with a password to sensitive information. And it just wasn't thought of to check on that. Is there a place to forward phishing for government or other organizations to know? You know, a lot of times your 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 software, Microsoft, has a place to report phishing emails so that they can protect against phishing. Uh, we use a program called Barracuda. It has a place to rec report. No before has a reporting mechanism in your email box reporting phishing emails. We actually have a service where we monitor those phishing emails. And so, yes, there are a lot of places to report for government or other organizations to know. But again, the overwhelming, there's just an overwhelming glut of information. And government is not going to take all that in, but there are data repositories that exist for phishing emails and known phishing emails. And a lot of companies will make their hay on that. I think we're just about out of time. I'm not sure where we're at on time, Ashley. Any more questions? Um, I just think I have one more that was sent kind of offline to me. Um, what would you, you recommend as the best way to secure like a direct deposit information for payroll purposes? As PBS, you know, we request or try to push onboarding and no emailing of documents, um, specifically checks, you know, things like that. But is there anything else that you might recommend off the top of your head for that securing that direct deposit information? Sure. You want to set up a secure file share um, when it comes to sending those things, something like Citrix, uh, ShareFile or things like that. You really want to have something like that in place to share data like that, where you can share a link to the file or to a box that has the file that has auditing on it, that has password management in place, something that's proven and tested. And, and, and that's important, you know, and, you know, you'd be surprised a lot of, a lot of the software you probably already have. Um, SharePoint has some encrypted tools that can do not SharePoint, but OneDrive has some tools that encrypt uh, that will encrypt information before it's sent. Whatever you do, you don't want to send it unencrypted. You don't want to send it over open email. You want to be sure uh, somebody can get right in the middle of that email. They call it a man in the middle attack where you think you're sending it to the person who you think you're sending it to. But realistically, is a person in the middle intercepting and posing as the person you think you're sending it to. And they send it back. They send you send it to them and they're getting all kinds of good information. And you don't even realize they're there. Because email, like text messages, can be intercepted very easily. And so, yes, you want a secure password service. I mean, a secure file sharing service for anything that you need to share along those lines. And I can make some recommendations. Just drop me an email. We can make some recommendations for you on that. All right. And I think that's going to answer our recommended best way to send data other than email is that secure share file as well. Um, right. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, if Please grab Jonathan's email right there on the screen below as well. If you have any follow-up questions, um, he would be happy to help. Um, I believe I speak for all of us in saying that we're tremendously grateful for that valuable information that you shared. Um, at this time, we will be going ahead and wrapping up this webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the CPE credits will be, or certificates will be issued in about two to three weeks following today's webinar. If there's anything that we can do to help you at PBS, there is mine and Meredith's contact information. And then you had Jonathan's before. So thank you again, Jonathan. That was amazing. Uh, I think that we're all maybe a little bit scared, but super grateful for that, um, that presentation.